Sam Mitchell and his Raptors taking on the Clips. First quarter, Raptors down 15-8. Watch Demario Moon left wide open for the slam. Well, he is one of the athletic young guys that they need on that perimeter and interior to play well. Look at Chris Kamen, the easy layup. Clips by five. Second quarter now, L.A. by three. Al Thornton. Everybody. Puts the Raptors up by five. Nice move by the Rook, but I want to see Sam Mitchell sideburns again. <laughs> Reminds me of Dolomite. Oh, oh <laughs> tough crowd. Chris Bosch, the jumper. Raptors up 57-56. Fourth quarter now. Corey Maggette. Richie from long two. Clips trail by two. Now, 14 seconds left in the game. Jose Calderon drives down the lane for a huge bucket. Gets the roll. And Toronto begins a season-high seven-game road trip with a win. The Raptors held the Clips to 28 second-half points. Chris Kamen posted his 10th straight double-double in the loss. The Clips have now dropped six straight at home. Last week, as part of our special NBA Access Charlotte, Rachel Nichols found out that though Michael Jordan is in the Bobcats' front office, his competitive fire is still burning bright. What do you think you're bringing to the table particularly that's making this team better? A winning attitude, attitude a winning presence, uh, versatility in the sense that I, I played the game at the highest level, I understood what it took to win. It's not the same, you know, I live vicariously through all the basketball experiences within my life, you know, my kids playing, you know, as well as, you know, the basketball team here, um, but nothing's going to replace me actually taking a shot, you know, unless we win a championship, then that could be, you know, that can happen, you know, but right now, nothing, you know, replaces that, that, that whole feeling, that control that I had once I had the ball in my hand. Jordan worked out with the Bobcats on Tuesday, going through a few drills with the guys. On Monday, Jordan also sat in on team meetings and film sessions. He's hoping to give the Bobcats a lift mentally. Sam is already lobbying for you to consider playing. He said to you. They can lobby all he want. They can't pay me much money. <laughs> all I did was shoot. And, you know, more or less just help the morale of the players. You know, for the last couple of days, it's all about just trying to get them to focus on the little things about playing as a team. Today wasn't anything other than me getting exercise, so don't take it out of context. No, I wasn't. Uh, <laughs> but so no comeback? No, not at all. All right, so no comeback is uh, imminent. Uh, Jay, what has been Jordan's impact in the front office in Charlotte? So far, not much. And the surprising thing to me is that he actually took on Jason Richardson's contract in the trade from the Golden State Warriors. Richardson still has three years and $40 million left. It's going to make it a little tougher for the Bobcats to have some salary cap flexibility. I think the one thing he did not get credit for when he was the executive for the Washington Wizards was how he cleared out a lot of the bad contracts. He got rid of Juwan Howard. He bought out Rich, Mitch Richmond. So he created the flexibility that Ernie Grunfeld was able to employ when he took over that general manager's job. But when I look at Michael Jordan and, and the things that he said in the interview, some of the things kind of concern me a little bit. I mean, he's still talking about himself as a player. You see the things that he talked about, what he brings to the table, a winning attitude, presence, and versatility. Those are things that players say. So I look at Michael Jordan having a tough time making that transition of getting away from that identity as Air Jordan, and now he's an executive. He needs to stay in that role, even though he can come down to the court and give the guys pointers and tips. But, you know, what sense does it make? Because he brings a distraction, I think, to the table also with his star personality. And when you Michael Jordan, it's a catch 22. So it's like the middle ground between what you gentlemen are talking about. And, and ultimately, when you Michael Jordan, you can do whatever you want to do. You can come out there and practice with the team. You can go on film sessions whenever you want. As a matter of fact, when you practice with the team and they have an Adidas logo, make sure you tape that up too because you're Air Jordan. Why is it so hard for ex-players who were great a lot of times to leave the game totally behind Larry Bird and Magic Johnson have obviously found different ways front office coaching to, to, to remain involved. Why is it so hard for ultra competitors to kind of let it go? Well, I don't think it's just hard for uh, top tier players. I think it's, it's hard for all players to let go of the NBA or their particular sport. Some guys, they identified with that sport. That's who they become for the majority of life. They spend so many years trying to get to that level and that's all you've known. And a lot of guys don't have a plan. I mean, to train transition out of the game and that's something that needs to be talked about you know with NBA players or professional athletes and young kids and it's an individual thing just because you are a great player or a marginal player or average player that doesn't mean you're going to translate into success and whatever you choose to do after ball including if that's a front office situation Jerry West one of the greatest players of all times one of the best general managers the bottom line is he hasn't won a championship we saw him win six with the Bulls 
We don't care about what happened with the Wizards. We don't care about what happens with the Bobcats unless he wins the championship because we want to see Michael Jordan be the best at everything he does. The thing is, he will never be the best again. He was the best basketball player. Anytime he walked on the court, he knew he was better than anyone else in the room. He can't say that now in his job. And even if he wins a championship, as he said, I don't think it will replace that feeling of actually making the shot, doing it yourself. It's like the difference between you doing it and watching your kids doing it. But when I look at Michael Jordan, everybody remembers the days of the Chicago Bulls. And I like that Michael Jordan. But but I also like the Michael Jordan with the Wizards because I'm the type of guy who evaluates talent by stripping away their athletic ability. And Michael Jordan still averaged 20 points a game. So obviously he still can play by, by that video. But, you know, at some point it is time to move on and, and, and let your legacy speak for itself. And I agree with you. I like that guy in Washington as well because the guy in Chicago who won the sixth championship against me and the Indiana Pacers. That guy in Washington, I got a chance to put up 30 on him a couple of times. <laughs> 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 you got take two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you heard uh, Michael Jordan say he's trying to give the guys a little uh, morale boost. The Bobcats could use it. They've lost 10 of their last 12. Coming up on NBA Fast Break, we have those who stood head and shoulders above the rest. The best of the best. Our hoop heroes on the way. I'll get things started. I'm taking the Red Hot Portland Trail Blazers, winners of eight in a row. Among the victims, Utah twice, Golden State in Denver, expected to struggle without Greg Oden. The Blazers, led by Brandon Roy, who's averaging 19 per, have tied Phoenix for the second longest winning streak in the league this season. Well, my hoop hero is John Salmon, University of Miami Hurricane product right there. 31 points, 7 assists, gave these guys a critical win on the road, even though it's just, they're just 2 and 10. I got to go with Andrew Bonham, the young fella. He sat here 40 minutes played, season high. They were concerned about his conditioning. Tonight, he just got stronger and stronger. 11 of his 12 points after halftime, plus 10 rebounds and four blocked shots for the big kid. Well, I'm going with the former minor league professional baseball player, <laughs> as well as number 23 slash number 45 of the Chicago Bulls, Michael Jeffrey George. Anytime you get a chance to see highlights of MJ, that's a great show. All right, Jordan working out with the Bobcats. Remember, Wednesday night on ESPN, Pistons and Celtics at 7 p.m. Eastern. Wow, but that's just the first of a double dip. Later in the evening, Suns and Mavs, and what a game. That should be a Wild West shootout. So the Suns, guys, fresh off that win in San Antonio over the Spurs, uh, continuing that little Texas trip there, uh, Jay, uh, playing the Mavs. Uh, let's get some quick thoughts on that game. Jay. This is a make-or-break season for both teams. If they don't get it done this year, if they don't get a championship parade at the end, got to blow up the team and try something else. I totally agree. When you talk about these two teams, we thought both of these teams were going to be in the finals last year. I really thought it because I was on the Phoenix Suns. Didn't get it done. Make or break. I agree with you. Well, I look at the Phoenix Suns, and it comes down to me, Amari Stoudemire. I mean, he has to play a critical role, put up double-doubles, and dominate the paint against the Dallas Mavericks. Which of these two teams would be the most likely to unseat the Spurs in the West? I think these two teams are built for each other. Not built for the San Antonio Spurs. Not, not playoff basketball. I don't think they unseat the Spurs at all. All right. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot for watching NBA Fast Break. For Jamal Jalen and J.A. Adande, I'm Mark Morgan. Have a great night, everybody.